Pastor Keith Moore, The Offerings of the Lord, Lesson 8, First Fruits, Part 2. Now for several weeks we have been ministering on the subject of the offerings of the Lord. And uh, we're continuing on that. Let's read our text again, 1 Peter 2, 5. He says, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The Amplified says, come and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. So we have been made a holy priesthood. Now, so many times that hadn't been a reality, but are we kings and priests unto our God? The Bible very plainly says that we've been made so. Well, what is a priest? If we're priests, what is a priest? And what does a priest do? Well, you'd have to go back to the Old Testament to get revelation of the uh, priesthood that God established in the first covenant. And even though we don't have the priesthood just like that, well, that was a type of what we do have. And to understand the reality, you know, we ought not neglect our Old Testament because it's full of beautiful types that you and I are, are to be living in now. You've got the type and you've got the, the real thing, the antitype. So what does, what does a priest do? Well, we've seen, and if you go back and read, you'll see that a big part of what the priest did was involved in the offerings of the Lord. I mean early and middle of the day and, and late and day after day after day, the offerings of the Lord were what they were involved in, big part of their ministry and service. Well, skip on over to the third chapter of Proverbs, please. Proverbs 3. For the last uh, three weeks or so, we've been looking at this verse concerning the offerings of the Lord. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 in the Amplified. Well, let me read it in King James first. He says, uh, honor the Lord with what? Very specific here now. Not just with your words. Not, not just with your life the way you live, but with what? Substance. With your substance. Now, this is specific as you can say it. This is your stuff, right? Your money, your material possessions. Isn't it something how people don't, some, a lot of people don't want to talk about that, do they? You just, you just bring that up, and immediately they go, oh, no. <laughs> I've actually heard people say, well, preacher, why don't you just stick to preaching? Why you got to talk about that? Well, what are we supposed to preach? The Bible? Well, that's what we're reading. Right? Honor the Lord with what? With your substance. And what? With the first fruits of all your increase. Now, there's a whole lot of Christians, man, they, they believe in honoring the Lord with your substance, but when you mention first fruits, they're like, hmm, I don't know about that, because they hadn't heard about it. But it's in the same verse, right? Is it okay to just chop verses up and say, well, this first third of it, that's good for us, but the rest of it, that's all passed away? Huh? No, honor the Lord with your Substance and with the first fruits of what? Now, we started talking last week about first fruits and the question, you know, because it hadn't been taught on a lot and people hadn't heard a lot about it, there's, there's questions. But here's answers to so many of them right here. The first fruits of what? What would a first fruit come from? Of all your increase. If there's no increase, there wouldn't be a first fruit. Increase. See, so many people have had the, the wrong idea about the offerings of the Lord, 
And I know there have been people that have preached wrong and used some of these verses just to prophesy money out of people's pockets into theirs. But you've got crooks in every profession. Right? I mean, you've got crooks, uh, doctors who are crooks and lawyers who are crooks and politicians who are crooks and preachers who are crooks, mechanics who are crooks, and, right? Carpenters who are crooks. And, list goes on. But that doesn't mean that all carpenters are crooks. Right? Or that all doctors are crooks. Or that all preachers are crooks. Or that all churches or ministries are crooked. No, it doesn't mean that. And, you know, if you pump your money into something year after year uh, that the people are just wasting the money or stealing the offerings, that's your fault. Thank you for those three amens. And somebody said, why, Brother Keith? Because you're not being led. The Holy Ghost would not lead you to do that because he knows what, uh, what you don't see. He knows what nobody else sees. He knows the hearts of men and women. See, people are so irresponsible in life. When things go wrong, they want to blame somebody. Did you hear me? People want to blame somebody. When something goes wrong, when they experience a loss, they want to blame somebody. If they lose money, they want to blame somebody. If they have an accident and a problem and get hurt, they want to blame somebody. That's when we got to sue happy. Yeah. Right? Yes. Why? Because they want to blame some. They want to make it somebody else's fault. But as a child of God, if we are led by the Holy Ghost all of the time, we miss these things. We don't have these problems. Now you've missed it and I've missed it too. But when you do, you need to be a man, you need to be a woman and take responsibility. And say, if I'd have listened to God, this wouldn't have happened. If I'd have listened to the Lord, I wouldn't be here right now in this situation. But thank God if you'll admit it and ask him to forgive you, he'll bail you out. I don't care how dumb you acted and, and how much ignorance there was. He's a gracious, merciful, forgiving God. Oh, he's bailed me out so many times. But you can't just try to blame somebody else. And when it comes to your money, you know, and, and where, you, where you're putting your tithes and where you're putting your offerings and your first fruits and all these kind of things... The number one thing over the whole deal is to be led by the Holy Spirit. Led by Him who lives inside you. And He's not going to lead you to put money into something where they're just wasting it and throwing it away. Or, you know, taking up money for one thing and just pocketing it. You know, take up money for an orphanage and go spend it on a sports car or something like that. The Holy Ghost not going to lead you to do that. Right? He know, even though you don't know, he's going to know. And that's why you don't, you don't just do things perpetually. You know, we are partners with a number of different ministries. But I, I, you know, I wouldn't sign a document with any of them that I will send you this much support forever. Why? People can change. Right? And there are ministries and ministers that were doing a fine job 10 years ago, but not today. Amen. Did you hear me? And there are people that wasn't doing so good five years ago, and they're doing good now. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Well, what should you do? <laughs> What's the answer to a thousand and one questions yeah. in these areas? Be led by the Holy Ghost. Don't, and see, the thing is, people so many times in churches, they, they don't want to be led. They want to be lazy. Well, you just tell us what to do. You tell us where to put our tithes, and you just tell us what to do. Where does these first fruits go? You just tell us. <laughs> no. And the person who told you they would tell you is wrong. Did you hear me? You're supposed to be led for yourself. See, it takes, it takes effort, though, doesn't it? People would rather just mechanically take the calculator and go 10% and just write the check and send it to the same place every time, the same place. You never have to think. You never have to pray about it. You never have to check your heart. People would rather do that. But that's not okay. Well, we're having fun now, aren't we? <laughs> no, we live... In the new covenant. Amen. 
And in the new covenant, we don't have to go to the priest or to the prophet and say, tell us what to do. Oh, come on now. He said, in that day, they'll not say every man to to each other, you know, their brother, know the Lord. He said, they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Oh, glory to God. Every one of us in this new covenant have the living spirit of God inside of us. Every one of us can come boldly right into the presence of the Almighty. A personal audience with the God of creation. There is one God and just one mediator between God and men, just one, just one. And it's not Mary and it's not St. Francis and it's not your pastor and it's not your wife. You do not have to go through anybody else to get to Jesus, to get to the Father, I'm saying, or to hear from God, the one man, Christ Jesus. He is the only mediator between God and me. The only. The only. Don't you dare pray to anybody else. I know that's strong, but it's time people preach the Bible. Dear me, I'm all this ungodly religious stuff that people are doing. It's no wonder they're not getting results. Aren't you glad that in this new covenant, you, not you plus me plus three other people, you right by yourself can come boldly into the presence of God and be received. You, I don't care if you were born again two days ago and can't find the scripture. You can come right into the presence of God in the name of Jesus and be heard. You can ask him, Lord, show me where to put my money. Show me what to support. He will hear you. He will answer you and show you what to do. Amen. Nothing else will take the place of that. Nothing else. Will, don't, don't you let somebody take his place. Be led. Everybody say, be led. Be led by the Spirit. The Bible said as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of of God and the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. I like it. Don't you like it? Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy I don't have to make an appointment with somebody else every Monday to get tell me what to do in this ministry, tell me what to do in this church. I'm so glad I don't have to ask forty five people, what do you think I ought to do? I can go straight to the source. Straight to the source of all wisdom and understanding and knowledge and direction. And you have exactly the same access as I do. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He said, honor the Lord. This is the Amplified. Honor the Lord with your capital. And sufficiency. How many know you'd have to have some? (laughs) Right? Honor the Lord. One translation says with your wealth. The NIV says honor the Lord with your wealth. Well, how could you do it if you had no wealth? You have to have some in order to do this. Is it the will of God for you to be wealthy? That was maybe a third of the crowd. I'm going to give you another opportunity now. Is it... Do it now. I'm not just saying this to get feedback. You need to say this out of your mouth for your sake. Jesus is the, the high priest of our confession. He works with what comes out of our, our mouths. Is it the will of God for you to be wealthy? Yes. Yeah, that's much better. Much better. Is it the will of God? We, we read Friday night. He takes pleasure. In the prosperity of his servant. I'm his servant. You're his servant, right? It pleases him. When we prosper and increase and do well, it it pleases him. Well, let's let's please God then. (laughs) He said, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Then your barns 
will be filled to overflowing. And you'll have too much wine to store it all, the English version says. Overflowing storage places and, and breaking out of new things. Hallelujah. And that happens when you honor the Lord with your stuff and when you uh, do so with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, last Sunday, we went into some detail talking about first fruits. And if we had time, in fact, once you go back to Leviticus, at least to cover this again. Uh, really, if, if you hadn't heard last week's message, it would, it would help you to, to get the tape or the CD. Because if I cover all that again, then we don't have time to move forward. But uh, if you go through the scriptures, and not just you know casually looking at it, but, but endeavoring to understand you'll see that there are more than one kind of offering. And this is our series talking about the offerings of the Lord. Well, we've talked about tithes. And the tithe, tithe literally means tenth or the tenth part. Or we'd say today, 10%. What is a percentage? It's a part. It's a portion. And we, we studied that, and I know myself, for years, I uh, combined first fruits and tithes together. But in studying it, I, I begin to see, well, now hold on, this, this, is, this doesn't work. How can it be the same? I begin to realize that the Bible differentiated in them and and. and uh, put them in different categories, and they actually went to different places. And uh, that's one of the first things that tipped me off. I thought, well, now how can that be? If it's the same thing, how can it go to different places? And first fruits are mentioned in, in my study uh, the same number of times as tithes, about 32 times each. You see references to first fruits and then references to tithes about 32 times each. And actually, you see first fruits mentioned in the Bible before tithes in Genesis 4 when Abel brought his offering to the Lord. You remember that? And the Bible saw, he said he brought of the what? The, he, he brought of, of the first, the, the fat, the best to the Lord. We, we, we call that sheep that he found fluffy because yeah. it was the best. And it, was, it wasn't just the best, it was the first. It was one of his first best sheep. Nothing said about tithe, nothing said about tenth in that passage. It's later on that you see Abraham bringing the tithe to Melchizedek. Now in Leviticus, are you there? This to me helps, uh, this one passage alone helps distinguish these things. In Leviticus, what chapter is it? It's the last chapter. What did I tell you? 27 is where you should go. Last chapter of Leviticus, Leviticus 27. Verse 26. Leviticus 27, 26. He says, Only the firstling of the beast, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it, whether ox or sheep. It is the Lord's. Yeah, amen. The first one. Now we read it at length and saw that the, the scripture said, The first one that opens the matrix, the first calf that a cow had, the first lamb. That, uh, that the sheep had, the first one, and the first of the crops that begin to come in, the first figs that got ripe, the first fruit that came on the tree or on the plant, they understood, they were taught this from the Lord, that that was holy to the Lord, and the first ones was His. And they brought it to Him. And it says, it is the Lord's. Now skip down to verse 30. He describes the, the first fruit all through these next 27, 28, 29. And verse 30 starts off with what? And. Did you see this? And 
all the tithe of the land. Now, if I had time, I could take you to a half a dozen different places where that's exactly, it talks about the first fruit, then it says, and the tithe. Differentiating like that. And notice this, all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Now, um, Verse 32, he says, concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy to the Lord. He'll not search whether it be good or bad. Now, that was not what you saw with the first fruits. The first fruits, so many times you see it says the first and the best. You'll see that word used a whole lot with first fruits, first and the best. But here, he said whether it was good or bad, the tenth one is the Lord's. This is not, this is not the first. This is not necessarily the best. It is the what? The tenth one. And the, the, the description was when the sheep would come out of the gate, the shepherd would count them with his rod, you know, to make sure he didn't lose any over the night. And when he took them out and when he brought them in, he'd go one, two, tap their backs with the rod when they went through the gate, seven, eight. Nine, the Lord's sheep. The tenth one, whether it was the healthiest one or the skinniest one, didn't make any difference. The tenth one was the Lord's. So the tenth one was the Lord's. And not just the first one mechanically, but the first one of all. In other words, you didn't, the, the, you didn't give the first calf every year. A lot of times there might be only one. You just, the first calf, period. The first, you know, the, the, of the first of the produce. Honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. We said that which opens the matrix. This is, this, this cow's never had a calf. And now when this calf comes, the Lord said the first one's mine. Well, now, you know, a lot of things go on here. The first one is special, right? And if you never had any income out of this particular cow, you're, you want to go, hey, I got, a, I got a calf, but are you going to put the Lord first, see? See, the, the question is here, do I acknowledge that I wouldn't have this new source of income if it wasn't for the Lord? Am I believing that I'm going to have a lot more income through this channel? Did I say source? Well, only one source, right? You know that. Through this channel, there's going to be a lot more. So the first one went to the Lord. He said, verse 33, he'll not search whether the tithe is good or bad, just the tenth was his. Now go with me. I'm going to read something to you, and then we'll go to another place here. Go with me, how about it, to uh, 2 Timothy, the second chapter. I'm going to read to you from Romans. Are y'all with me today? Believing with me? I got a lot of things here, and I don't want to take too much time on any one of them. The scripture said in Romans 11, well, you, you should look at it again. I'm trying to move a little too fast here. Go to Romans 11 on your way. You, you just pass right by there on your way to 2 Timothy. Stop by Romans 11. We read it last time, but let's read it this time. I want to just talk about primarily first fruits in the New Testament now. In the New Testament, you'll find numerous references to first fruits. And you'll find it in more than one area. The Bible said that Jesus himself is a first fruit. Actually, the first fruit. The firstborn from the dead. You'll find that phrase some half a dozen times in the New Testament. 
that he is the firstborn and of the first fruits. Firstborn. First Corinthians 15, you don't have to turn there, just hold your place there. But he said, Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. And the Bible tells us, calls us now, the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Jesus was the first one to ever be born again. And he's the first one to be born, raised from the dead. Now somebody might say, well, what about Lazarus? He wasn't raised from the dead like Jesus was. His body was raised from the dead, but remained mortal and died again. Jesus' spirit was quickened. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he became the firstborn from among the dead, body changed to immortality and cannot die and cannot be corrupted. And the Bible says our body is going to be like his wonderful body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the scripture talks about blessed is he that has a part in the first resurrection. That's you and I. Because on him and her, the, sec- the, the, the second death has no power. You know, you die, you can die physically, but there is a death. Where death and hell, you know, and, and uh, the lake of fire and all that, that has no power over those who are raised from the dead in the first resurrection. That's me, that's you. Right? And we are the church of the firstborn, Jesus being the first fruits of them raised from the dead. Well, the Bible also talks about that the Christians, the first ones to be born again in an area, they were called first fruits. The Bible said in Romans 16, he said, uh, greet the church and salute uh, Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia. He said in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, that was Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16. He said the house of Stephanus is the first fruits of Achaia. First fruits. James said concerning those individuals, he said that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The first Christians born again, he said, were first fruits. Now, another area, the Bible said that we that have received the Holy Ghost have received the first fruits. Of our inheritance. What's a first fruit? Well, now this is exciting because the first fruit is just like the first mess or the first handful or the first one. What does that mean that comes later? The whole harvest. The whole rest of the harvest coming in, that's what we got to look forward to. Have you ever been blessed in God? Have you ever been blessed in being filled with the Spirit? That's just the first fruits. The greatest time you've ever had is just the first fruits of what's coming up. Whoo! That's exciting. I said, that's exciting. But then there is, in the New Testament, reference to first fruits on a material application, just like it was in the Old Testament. Now in uh, Romans, are you there? Let's look at these places. Romans 16. No, excuse me. 11. 11, 16. Romans 11, 16. He said, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, how many understand he is giving us a principle, isn't he? This is a principle, and if you knew the Old Testament, you knew exactly what he's talking about. You were very familiar with it. But Gentiles who didn't know the Old Testament, this is foreign. Listen to the NIV. If part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. The Knox translation says, when the first loaf is consecrated, the whole batch is consecrated. Amplified, if the first handful is of dough offered as first fruits is consecrated holy, so is the whole mass. 
And you can begin to see why the Lord would direct them to do this. He is directing them to do something that gives him access to the rest of the production of this channel. <laughs> the principle is Matthew 6.33. Seek ye. What? Not second, not third. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All the, you could say it like this, all the rest. Put him first and all the rest is going to come. Well, then when God creates for you a new channel of income, here's a cow, never had a calf, but here she had a calf. Here, here's a sheep, ha, never had a sheep, but here's the first one. Here's, a, here's an area of income you never thought about getting into, but here it is, a, br a brand new area. And the Lord spoke to us, you know, some weeks ago about new channels new areas. See, this is how God prospers us. You got to watch about just getting your eye on one thing. Well, I've been working at my job for the last 10 years, and this is my little paycheck, and this is what I get, and this is how I do. Well, no, that's not all God can do for you. God can have 50 other things going for you at the same time. That's how wealthy people become wealthy and become wealthier. They're not working 12 jobs. They just check on their investments after they have their coffee and read their paper. <laughs> Are you listening now? They check on, and their money is working in this area and their investment is working over here while they sleep. Right? You just check on it. You do, see, you ought to be diligent in whatever your job is. You ought to be. But hard work does not assure wealth. I said hard work does not on its own, just that by itself, and that's all you're looking to, that alone does not assure wealth. There have been people who worked their self into an early grave and died poor. You ought to be diligent at the job the Lord told you to do. Right? But that doesn't mean that you look to your job as your source. In fact, go, go to Ephesians. The fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. He said, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, neighbor, for we're members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, let him work, working with his hands the thing which is good, so he can make a living. Huh? Ain't that why we work? No. <laughs> Mixed response. <laughs> like you see, I've seen bumper stickers before. It said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Boy, if you got one of them on, you better take it off before you drive out of here today. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Well, and you know, so much of the popular songs that people sing and they listen to is, I'm a working man, you know, you know, oh, I work hard for my money. <laughs> I ain't got nothing, but I'm proud. <laughs> I'm a working man. I'm a working woman. <laughs> well, as you think in your heart, yeah. right? And as you believe and say out of your mouth, that's where you'll stay. I'm, I got to work hard to make a living. I got to make a living for myself and, and my, my family. I got to make a living. You are supposed to be diligent. Nobody's supposed to be lazy. 
Everybody is supposed to work. Everybody is supposed to work. Everybody. I'm going to say that again real slow. How many people? Everybody. I don't care if you got 10 million sitting in the bank. You're supposed to be working somewhere. Amen. And being, being a blessing to somebody, working. But you do not set yourself up as the source, as your source, as your family's source. I got to go work. I got to make a living. See, then you're looking at your job as your source. And you are the, the, the origin of the source because you're the one who produces the money through the job. Now, what did he say? He didn't say tell the, the man who used to be a thief, get a job so you can make a living and pay your bills. What did he say? Get a job and work. Make some money. So what? So you can have some seed. Boy, isn't this a different way of thinking than most people do? So you can have some seed to sow so you can have to give to him or her that needs. Oh, my, my. Then when you do that, you're not living off your job anymore. You're not living off your check anymore. You're sowing that. You're living off the harvest. Oh, glory to God. Few folk are getting this kind of slow. Is this a different way of living? It's just a completely different way of living. And, and people come too late to tell me it doesn't work. I've been there. We, Phyllis and I grew up, we grew up poor. And even after being in the ministry for a number of years, just poor, just broke, broke, broke. And we got a hold of this. And we began to get a vision. We saw, you know, we got to get our priorities right. We got to be more interested in sowing than we are making payments and just doing our stuff. So I, I've told you, you've heard us talk about it. We, we had a car that we got. We, we sold that. We sold some other stuff. We got rid of some payments. Uh, we, we, we didn't go out and eat as much. We, we began to put money that we could put together into sowing. And we became partners with this one and partners with that one. And we sowed and we sowed. And over the years, we just got more and more blessed until the last, you know, last job I worked where I got a salary, I was working for a ministry. I put more into that ministry that year than they paid me. Total. Of my whole salary, I put more in. How do you do that? I said, how can you do that? I mean, we, we lived at a level, we, we had house, we had cars and stuff, and people sometimes ask me, they said, how much do they pay you over there? I said, not this much. <laughs> well, how do you do it? Actually, people that didn't know us one time, we pulled up in a new car, and it was actually a person behind the uh, counter at a convenience store, and they said, whoa, look at that. They said, you know, uh, another person said, well, I wonder where he got that, and they said, I bet he sells drugs. They sell drugs. I said, I don't sell drugs. <laughs> but see, people that try to work it out in their minds, they, 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 don't, they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in God providing for you. But what was happening, it was coming from over here, and it was coming from over here, and from here, unexpected channels. And it was coming in on such a consistent basis that we're living at a much higher standard than you'd think we could uh, by looking at our salaries. But our job was not our source. That didn't happen in a month or two, but over a period of time, it happened. Oh, friend, you can get free. I said, you can get free. Thinking, well, this is all I got and I have to do this. No, no, no. Look at your job as the, a way that God brings seed to you. And then you sow your seed and you don't live off of your check. You live off your harvest. Don't let this get away from you now. Meditate on this. Think about this. Talk about this until this gets in your spirit and you get excited about it and you begin to live like this. And what this is is living by faith. How many know you can get up, you can go to work, you can punch the clock, you can go home at five without living by faith? I mean the whole world's doing that, right? You can just go and pick up your check from what you do and go home and you can deposit. You can do that without living by faith at all. Does that please God? 
without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So we must not just live like the rest of the world lives. We must live by faith. Which means you don't know where it's coming from or how it's going to get there. But you'll just put the biggest whopping thing on your list that you can think of without a clue as to how it could come to you. You don't have to figure that part out. Just believe for it. Just claim one. You say, well, you know how much that costs? I'm not paying for it. There's a number of things people have given me. I don't know that I'd have paid that for it. But they gave it to me. Well, glory to God. What are you going to do? Thank you, Lord. Right? You got to watch about every time you think about getting something, you think, well, I have to pay for it. And I don't only make so much a week. How in the world could I ever save enough to, to be able to do that? You are not walking by faith. You're walking completely by sight. And you don't believe you can get anything that you can't buy with your little check. So you've limited God, you've capped God in your life. No, no, not us. Not us, not this faith life church bunch. No, we live by faith. It means we don't have to see how it can come. We don't have to have a clue where it would come from or how it could come. We just believe for it anyway. We got some folks need to go back to their list and work on it a little bit more. Examine it because you you know only put stuff on there that you can figure out how to get. Hmm? Well, I could go a lot of ways with that right now. And another thing, you know, Phyllis was reading that testimony this morning about the folks that the parents that you know they thought well they could uh, their daughter was believing for that computer, and they wanted to just go get it for, her. but they realized no. No, no, she's believing for this. We need to let her use her faith. Did you hear that now? Watch out that you don't try to become somebody's source like your children and you're going to make their list come to pass. You better watch out you're getting God's way. Right? No, let them believe for it. Now, if God deals with you to do something, you do what he deals with you to do. But otherwise, you let them stand and believe. If it takes a while, it takes a while. Well, I don't know, Brother Keith. What if it goes too long and they don't get it? So you don't believe it yourself. <laughs> Got major unbelief here. Same God that meets your needs. Meet their needs. Same God meets the needs of this church. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah. Whew. Man, I'm trying to preach this message, but. Uh, go with me, please, to 2 Timothy, if you got your place there. Here is one of the most specific references to first fruits that affect material things in the New Testament. 2 Timothy, the uh, second chapter, verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Uh, Ministry is always to be multiplying. And we, that, that is happening in this place, but it must happen a whole lot more. Everything God gives you is ultimately for you to sow into somebody else. Right? We're supposed to be multiplying not just our seed, our natural seed, but our self. The love that's in us, the faith that's in us, the revelation that's in us, we ought to be sowing that seed, right? He said, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who's chosen him to be a soldier. 
And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he's not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Now see, that wouldn't sound familiar to a Gentile who didn't know the word, but what about somebody who grew up with first fruits? First partaker of the fruits. Now listen to another translation. Uh, the NAS says the hard working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. The laboring husbandman must first of the fruits be partaker. That is the literal translation of that verse. The laboring husbandman or farmer must first of the fruits be partaker. Now you see another phrase, oh, you, I don't know how many times you see it in the Bible, numerous times, that the laborer is worthy of his hire. Remember that? You see, Jesus quoted that more than once. And then also, you see, in fact, we're, we're close by here. In 1 Timothy, just back up a little bit, 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, and the 17th verse, 1 Timothy 5, 17, he said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor, labor in the word and doctrine. <laughs> I know uh, some years ago, I hadn't seen some, relative, some of my distant relatives, and I'd been in school, been in the ministry, and we were in for some kind of a family deal, and I saw them. They asked me what I did now, and I told them. They said, you mean you don't work? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I know that there are, there are a lot of preachers that just, uh, you know, play golf all the time and then on Saturday night get a little something out of Reader's Digest. And <laughs> I mean, know what I'm talking about, and, and, and I know that. But if you do the ministry like you're supposed to, it's work. Well, there's been many a time in the ministry that I've sat looking out my window at my, at my uh, desk dealing with issues, believing God to find answers for problems that people are just don't know what to do in their life. And I've thought, man, digging a ditch would be a lot easier than this. You know, because I've worked manual labor all my life. I know what it is. It'd be a lot easier. But labor, he said, in the Word and, and doctrine. For the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And the laborer is worthy of his reward or his hire. Now, uh, here he, see, he paints the picture of the ox. In fact, it's in the law. I mean, you go back to the, you know, the first five books of the Bible, the law, and you'll see that it was included that if the ox is helping you get the crop in, you don't put a muzzle on him. If he wants to take a few bites as he goes along, you let him eat. Right? Yeah. Now God put that in the Bible yeah. for the cow yeah. and, and the donkey. Yeah. Right? Yes. How many say when the Lord tells you that, well, you, bet, you better not put a muzzle on him. That's right. yeah. Well, what is the donkey eating? You, you put him in there. Well, this, I mean, this is before anybody else gets to eat it, right? I mean, he, this is first fruits. He's eating up. And, and I guess, you know, you just let him eat what he wants to while, he, while he's working the field. You don't just turn him in there by himself and leave him for three days at a time. But while he's hooked to the plow, while he's hooked to the wagon, while he's doing the work, you let him eat. If he wants to reach and take a bite over here, take a bite over here. You don't, you don't hit him. You don't fuss at him. You let him eat. Right? And here he says in uh, 2 Timothy the husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Now here he's writing to a pastor and he's giving him instructions. And he, what, do, what does this mean? What does this mean to a pastor? The husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Well, go to 1 Corinthians 9. <laughs> First Corinthians nine. Now 
Now here is the Holy Ghost through Brother Paul, an apostle, saying some things about areas that people have had all kind of questions about. 1 Corinthians 9, 1. He says, am I not an apostle? They knew he was. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? Well, they'd had to answer yes to all those questions or just be liars. Right? They didn't know anything about God. He came and preached to them. They, they didn't get saved till then. If I be not an apostle to you, unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you, the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. Fruit of ministry is obvious, isn't it? If the word's getting results, it's obvious. If there are results, it's obvious. Man and woman can't produce stuff in their own flesh. It'd have to be by the anointing. It'd have to be the, the results of the word. Producing results in people's lives. He said, uh, verse 4, Have I not power, or another translation says, the right, the right to eat and drink? Now, now you got to answer this. Why, why would he say, don't I have the right to eat and drink? Why, why is he saying that? At your expense. At the church's expense is what he's saying. He's not just saying, don't I have the right to eat and drink? I mean, why even ask that? He said, it, he's saying at the church's expense. Have we not power or the right to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brother of the Lord and Cephas? What, what does that mean? Don't I have a right to take care of a wife, to take care of a family? From what? Why is he telling them this? Well, see, he started out by saying, I'm an apostle to you. You came up under me. Right? People are afraid to talk about these things, aren't they? And here they are, black and white. They're right here real plain. We need to talk about them. We need to have them plain. Get them settled. This is the Holy Ghost talking. Are, are I only in Barnabas, have we not a right to forbear working? Now he's talking about working secular employment. Are we the only ones who don't have a right to not have jobs on the side? Our other jobs. Friend, there, there is a thing that is really twisted in so many Christian circles. There are people, churches, who are proud that they don't pay their ministers. A lot of small churches especially. I mean, they're, they're, they'll brag on how that their preachers, you know, work 50 hours a week at some other job and don't take a dime and don't ask for a dime, and they brag on that. That's not okay. I said it's not okay. And they spend all this money on other stuff and don't take care of their ministers. Now y'all take care of us. I'm, I'm not heading toward anything on this. But there needs to be right thinking because it is widespread thinking that preachers ought not have much. There was a well-known minister that was being interviewed a while back, and, and I don't think he knew it was coming, but it, they weren't much into it until here they, they pop up pictures of, of his house and pictures of this and, and ask him, why, why do you have this? Well, I don't know how the man got it, but, the, but the, the point is not that. The point is, why do people think it's wrong? Where did that come from? Now, if you look in, in the law, all the first fruits went to the priests. And all the tithes went to the Levites. I won't take time to go through it, but you study it out for yourself. But man, it don't take too much thinking to realize that everybody that had a crop come in and everybody in a nation of millions, 
They brought all this stuff on a continuous basis. These people were rich. They were super rich. And it's also why the Lord put certain things in the word that forbid anybody that wasn't in the ministry for trying to get in there. There are people that fell dead for intruding into ministry places. Why would you have to say things like that? Because people wanted to get in there because of the finances. Well, boy, that's changed today, hasn't it? I know, I know people. I talked with a guy not that long ago, and he's been running from God for years. Because he, he, he believes he's got a call on his life, but he don't want to be broke. <laughs> that's right. We talked about it. He, he's been doing everything he can to make money. He wants to be wealthy and he wants to have resources. And he thinks if he goes into the ministry, he has to forget that, kiss that all goodbye. And that's what the Bible talked about with the Levite and with the priest. He said they, don't, they didn't receive the inheritance like the other people. They didn't receive all this land and all these resources. And that's why they get all the first fruits. So instead of being out there working the land all the time and working their herds and flocks, they're working in the business and the things of God. But that don't mean they're broke because when these guys have a fresh crop come in, they bring the first part of it right to them. Now keep reading this. He said, who goes a warfare any time at his own charges? What's the answer to that? Nobody. Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Does this sound familiar? And who feeds the flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? He said, say I these things as a man, or says not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? In other words, did he just write that just for oxen? No. Or says he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that plows should plow in hope. And that he that threshes in hope should be what? Partaker of his hope. If we have sown to you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Is that a spiritual principle that you find in more than one place in the Word? Galatians says, and well, in fact, hold your place here. Turn over there and look at it. Galatians 6, verse 6. Galatians 6, 6, let him that is taught in the word do what? Communicate to him. Now that word literally means to sow or to share with him that teaches in all good things. I've had people come up to me before and say, well, Brother Keith, you know, the Bible said communicate to him that teaches you. So I want to tell you what I think about this. <laughs> That is not what that means. <laughs> Communicates an old English word here that means share. Share. And the spiritual print, in fact, here let me give you another one. Turn back to Romans. The 15th chapter. Romans 15:27. 1527, it has pleased them verily, for their debtors they are, 1527 of Romans, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in carnal things or natural things. Do you have a duty to minister natural things to people who minister to you spiritually? then why does this seem like a foreign concept to so many people? I'll tell you one reason. The, the Bible also says, as the priest and as the prophet, so the people. The devil wants preachers broke. Because 
their congregations and their partners' prosperity is tied to them. Did you hear that? He wants preachers broke because he doesn't want he doesn't want young people to want to be one. Do you hear that? He wants ministers to be defeated, to be broke, to be shabby, so that they're not an example. You can tell when things are beginning to get right when you get little ones, little boys and little girls. Say, they, they don't just say only, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be, they also say, I want to be a preacher. Right? We hear that frequently around here. God. Glory to God. Why? Why would they want to be like somebody who's always broke and always defeated and always begging? Now back, back, back up to this, 1 Corinthians 9, or over, I guess, 1 Corinthians 9. We have, well, Phyllis and I are partners personally. This church is partners, and More Life Ministries is partners with people that have sown into our life spiritual things over the years. You're to never forget that. Never. And so we sow to them natural things. Some people I send money to personally every month because they, they influenced my parents. They influenced my grandparents. And that influence affected me. Right? And where would you be if you'd had no spiritual influence for God? Where would you be? Where would I be? That's why he said it's your duty. When you receive spiritual things, you have a duty to minister natural things. That's what the Bible says. Now, 1 Corinthians 9, are you there? Let's finish reading this. There's another side to this I want you to see. He said, verse 11, if we have sown to you spiritual things... He said, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things, your natural things? If others be partakers of this power or right over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power or right, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now let me just stop right here. You have to read the whole rest of this to see what was going on. There were people that had come in to the churches where Paul had, that Paul had started and came in and told these people, we are apostles and you're supposed to give us so much money and you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. And they were doing it because these people were so forceful and so pushy. That is one characteristic that you can tell somebody's off because God's not that way. Amen. He is not pushy. He is not manipulative. He never tells you, you have to do this. Because you don't. You have a free will. You don't have to do anything that pleases God. But these people were doing it and the people were pouring all this money into these false apostles. And that's what he's telling them by the Holy Ghost. He said, hey, if anybody's your apostle, it's me. Amen. Right? Amen. Isn't that something, you know, you, you see it all the time, how that people forget the individuals that really were influential in their life and get caught up with somebody who's a legend in their own mind. <laughs> and pushy and demanding it's sad how people are so foolish that they just get sucked into this. And what they're doing, they're not supporting him. And they're sending their support to these people who are not even real apostles. Now, now notice what he says. He said, but, he said, I 
have not used my right. In other words, I have not demanded this of you, but I suffer all this, verse 12, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now keep reading. Verse 15, skip down to verse 15, I'm going to come back to these others. He said, I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done to me. He said, I'm not writing this so that you'll start sending me money. He said, it was better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Now, boy, you really get some insight into the man here and into the heart of God. He gets animated at this point. Keep reading. He says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Whether I get paid, whether I don't, I got a commission. I got to do it. Verse 17, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Does that remind you of another verse over in Isaiah? If I do it willingly, I have a reward. What if you don't do it willingly? If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You've got to be willing. If I do it willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel, we might say, is still committed to me. I still got to call. What's my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power or my right in the gospel. Oh, do you see this? We could read more of it, but what's he saying? He said, I have a right to be supported by you. I have a right not to have to make tents. Do you hear what he's saying? In other words, he's saying, if you were doing what you're supposed to be doing, all this would be taken care of. He said, I have a right to my whole family to be supported by you, uh, through, through you. I have a right. He said, but I didn't write this to you so you'd send money. He said, in fact, he said, I preach the gospel without charge. Nothing. He said, I'd rather die then anybody take this away from me. That's strong now, isn't it? And the further I go, the more I feel that way myself. I, you know, the Lord's helped us. And, and we've talked about some of this, but you, you may understand more why we do some things that way. We go out and we don't ask for a thing. I don't care where we go. I don't care how much it costs. We, don't, we, we never hand people a bill and say, look, it costs this much for us to get here. Ever. Because we don't have to. Did you hear me? We never say, hey, you, you got to cover our expenses. No, no, no. And so it, it's actually has irritated Phyllis and I before. There's been not too many times, but we've been in places where people get up and say, hey, you know, we, uh, y'all give in the offering because uh, we got to cover the budget for bringing Brother Keith in. Yeah. There wasn't no budget for bringing me in. Didn't cost them a dime for me to come Amen. or to get me there. Yeah. Did you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, you almost want to get up and say, whoa. Yeah. Of course, now that would put a damper on the evening probably. Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but what are we saying? That we do not have to be beggars. Amen. No, in fact, we can take a stance just like Paul. It cost you nothing to come here. It cost you nothing to hear the gospel. It cost you nothing to go in these meetings. Now, it cost something, but it cost you nothing. And there is no charge. No charge. We talked about this when, when you, as a church, talked about uh, paying Phyllis and I. We sold our first year, you remember, but then after that, you're, you're the board that represents you and different ones of you. We want to pay you. And we talked about that. I don't, I don't want it to be a pay that you owe us. We give our ministry to you and to God. And anything you're giving us, you give it to us. Right? This, this is, we don't charge and there's no pay in that sense. You understand what we're talking about now? It makes a difference in your thinking. 
But see here, if you notice, he talks about first fruits. He talks about the principle. Let me read 1 Corinthians 9 in the New Living. And I'm trying to close. He said, what soldier has to pay his own expenses? Have you ever heard of a farmer who harvests his crop and doesn't have the right to eat some of it? What shepherd takes care of a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? For the law of Moses says, do not keep an ox from eating as it treads out the grain. Do you suppose God was thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he also speaking to us? Of course he was. Just as farm workers who plow fields and thresh the grain expect a share of the harvest, Christian workers should be paid by those they serve. Now skip down to the 13th verse here. I'm still reading from the New Living. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their meals from the food brought to the temple as offerings? Well, that was first fruits and offerings and tithes. Uh, he said, and those who serve at the altar get a share or a portion of the sacrificial offerings. Well, we know the Levites got 10%. In the same way, the Lord gave orders that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Verse 14, do you see it? Even though the Lord's ordained that they that preach the gospel should live how? By other means. By five other jobs. Huh? They just have to be resourceful on their own and make some good investments because they ain't going to get anything out of the ministry. That's what people have reduced it to, but it was never that way from the beginning. And it's not supposed to be that way now. Now, we don't have much time to talk about it, but where does the first fruit go? Well, the Bible said it is the Lord's. It is the Lord's. The Bible talks about they brought it to the house of the Lord. Numerous places it said it was the priest's. Numerous places. One time it said, you know, uh, an individual brought first fruits to the man of God, Elisha. He used it to feed people that were under his ministry at the time. But here's the big thing. All these things are precedent. Precedent. You don't take any of these things and try to practice them legalistically. Nor do you do it with tithing. We, the reason we've covered all these other areas is because you must get the spirit of it. We live in the New Testament. We don't operate by law. We don't operate by legalism. What's the answer to a thousand and one questions on all these things? Yes. Is this a first fruit? You're talking about something? What is a first fruit? If you don't know, don't act. Right? Where does it go? If you don't know, keep praying about it. Don't try to figure out a system that you can just do every time and never have to pray about it and be led. That's not New Testament. Come on now, are you with me? That's with your tithing, that's with your first fruits, that's with all your offerings. Don't try to work out a system. Well, every time this happens, then I take this and I always give it to this place and I always do it this. No, no, no. Things will come up, and you'll just know in your heart, this is a first fruit. You'll know it, right? It'll be up to you whether you act on it or not, but you'll know it. Where does it go? The Lord will show you. I said the Lord will show you. He'll show you. The house of the Lord, the minister of the Lord, the ministries of the Lord, He'll show you. If you don't know, keep praying until you get it clear. But when it's all analyzed, when it all comes down to the bottom of it, what are we doing day in and day out? We are honoring the Lord, and we're doing it as we're led. We're led. And when you walk close with the Lord, you just know things. Something will come up. I know when our, the first offering that came in this church, the very first one, Phyllis and I knew this is a first fruit. Right? We sent it to somebody else, another church. The very first offering that we ever got out of this church, we knew. We believed there'd be a lot more to come. So we could turn loose of this one, right? Easily. 
But it was, you could tell, this is first. This is special. It's the first time this kind of thing has happened in our life. And then we knew, we prayed about it a little bit, we knew exactly. In that case, we sent half of it to one place and half of it to another. See, how can you legalize that? How can you put all that down in a rule book? You can't. You're not supposed to. So instead of writing down a bunch of questions for me, <laughs> is this a first fruit, Brother Keith? Or is that a first fruit? Do I send my first fruit here? Or, or when do I send my first fruit? Or is it okay to send it there? Let me save you a lot of time. You and me. I'm going to go ahead and answer all your letters right now. <laughs> and all the letters from people on the internet, I'm going to go ahead and answer them all right now. Be led. Period. Every day, in every situation, all the time, not by what somebody else tells you to do, out of your own insides, be led. Stand up on your feet. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, Father, I pray concerning this. I feel like I went around different places trying to get there. But, Lord, you, your word does not return void. Cause it to sink in exactly where you would that it should and everyone to understand it the way you would that they should. Bring us more light and revelation in all these areas. Help us to see not a legalistic side, but to see the living spirit and truth of all your word, the whole counsel of God taken together, the whole word of God rightly divided and applied in our lives. Reveal it to us day by day. And we purpose not to be hearers only, but doers. Doers. Said out loud, Lord, as you lead me, I will follow. What you direct, I will do. What you instruct, I will obey. I will honor you with my substance, with my wealth, and with the first fruits. Of all my increase, I will honor you in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed this message from Pastor Keith Moore from Faith Life Church in Branson, Missouri. We're working on getting this lesson formatted and ready for translation into many languages. One of our goals is to curate and duplicate the best teaching in the world. There are millions of sermons and lessons online and many that are great but not effectively managed. Most of the time, they are disorganized and unfiltered. It is very confusing for a new believer to find in-depth quality teaching that will lay a strong faith foundation. Visit faithtrainers.com forward slash Eagle Team to learn more. Grow fast. Grow strong. Glorify God.